now i would like to call on uh, uh, clifton d rosario to just introduce the speakers and introduce a little bit about today's program Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, in a way, from the morning, it's been quite an exciting day for all of us. This very uh, different moment in history that our country is going through. I think uh, uh, there's hardly any debate about that. This is a very unique moment in time. And in this unique moment in time, what we have done as uh, members of the legal profession, what we believe in, rather, is that as lawyers, as litigators, as law students, as members of this legal profession, what is the role that we have in facing this, these changed and extremely challenging kind of a uh, situation? And I think here, more than anything else, we go back and we draw our inspiration from, uh, of course, the various uh, advocates, lawyers, who throughout history, in times of this and far more perilous uh, moments have actually stood up to power, stood up on the side of people, fought for the rights of people. In this, I think uh, we, we uh, definitely remember the advocates who stood up to even Hitler at the time when, when the Nazis ruled Germany. When we come to our country, we definitely remember the legacy of the freedom movement and the, and the historic role that advocates have played, whether it is Mahatma Gandhi, whether it is Nehru, whether we come all the way to Baba Sahib Ambedkar and the constitution that he has given us. So I think in a way, we are drawing on that inspiration and we believe that when there's such a big challenge that this country is facing, we as advocates need to fight. And that's the purpose for us having uh, uh, tried to bring together advocates under the umbrella of the All India Lawyers Association for Justice. Uh, today, the open session is part of the first national conference. Uh, there are delegates from 11 states who have come to uh, Bangalore. There were many more delegates who were supposed to come. But unfortunately, almost 25 of them could not come because their train tickets could not get confirmed. I think there is something to be read between the lines there. That these are advocates who can travel by train. And these are advocates who cannot get their train tickets confirmed. And that's the sole reason that they could not turn up over here. And we look at the legal profession, when we look at our own legal community, we see that, and what the pandemic in a way I think exposed for us, is that the majority of the people in the legal profession actually live a life of great precarity. Their livelihoods are not secure. And that's something that we want to address even in this organization. It is not just about the, the attack on the constitution, it is also about the social and economic disparity that we find within the, legal uh, within the legal profession. So broadly, this is the theme with which our organization began. Over the last one and a half year, we've been able to create some kind of a space for ourselves and some kind of a voice. I think somewhere one knows that you're on the round pa right path. Uh, when you're walking down the high court after arguing a matter, like I did yesterday, and some counsel comes to you and says, you better be careful, sir. I think, you know, things are really not going to work out for you in the future. So I think when a warning like that comes to you, you know that you're doing the right thing, you're rattling the right uh, uh, the gates over here. I really am very happy today also because there are some very dear uh, friends, some people who we sincerely look up to in the profession who are in our midst today. Uh, Mr. Subarao, who is... Uh, and his words fail us. He's uh, stood up for the rights of workers for the past 65 years at the various courts of Karnataka. I am most delighted to say that uh, Mr. Subarao is in our midst and I kindly request everyone to come in. <laughs> to give you a, a small example of what uh, Mr. Subarao stands for, there was a matter being argued the other day and Mr. Subarao was appearing online. And the judge said something and the management lawyer, as usual, uh, is trying to deny the worker some basic wages. And Mr. Subarao, in his typical style, bangs the file and says, these are workers, not slaves. Now that is the kind of, uh, uh, kind of um, person that Mr. Subarao is. I'm very, very happy that he's in our midst. We also have uh, uh, two uh, very luminaries of, the, uh, of, the, of our bar, of the Karnataka bar. Mr. Aditya Sondi and Mr. Arish Narsappa, 
I'm more than happy to say that they've also, they're here in the midst, a very, uh, with a very warm, uh, I welcome them and I, uh, I hope all of you can just welcome them as well. There are several other friends, Mr. Dathar, for instance, who is here in our midst, Mr. Malagoda again. There are so very few people that we can count in our bar who are strong, who are dedicated, who are committed to the constitution, who are committed to the rights of workers, who are committed to the rights of the poor, very few. And some of them are here, including Mr. Dathar. I sincerely welcome you as well, sir. There are several other friends from various other organizations over here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, Mihir uh, is, a, is a very dear friend and somebody who inspires all of us. Uh, we all know the typical, of course, introduction to Mr. Mihir Desai would be that he is a senior counsel practicing in the Supreme Court, practicing in uh, uh, the Bombay High Court for the past so many decades. But I think there are certain other things of uh, Mr. Mihir Desai which I'd also like to share with you. When the government of India abrogated Article 317 in the Constitution, and there was, a, there was a sense of insecurity, instability that set in in Kashmir. Mr. Mihir Desai was one of the people who actually conducted a fact-finding to try and understand what the situation was. Please remember, this was a time when no one could go into Kashmir. You could not come out of Kashmir safely. There were people being stopped at the airports. Mr. Uh, Mihir Desai is one of the people who actually went there and came up with one of the best reports on the situation over there. Mihir has also been a counsel who stood up for the rights of victims of any kind of caste violence or communal violence. We all remember the genocide in Gujarat in 2002. Uh, Mr. Mihir Desai has been the counsel for the victims in several of those cases and practicing in those courts facing that kind of resistance over there. More recently, Mr. Mihir Desai has represented Father Stan Swami and uh, at least ensured that he got to the hospital. And Mr. Mir Desai also is the uh, counsel for uh, uh, Sudha Bharadwaj, who luckily is now out in bail. I sincerely, on behalf of All India Lawyers uh, Association for Justice and everyone here, I welcome uh, Mr. Mir Desai and I wholeheartedly thank you, sir, for being with us today. Thank you. Without, I just request now Mihir, if he can come and share his words with us. Uh, we will need some bit of translation, so I'm going to request you all to bear with us. There are some friends who come here from the northern states who don't, uh, who, for whom Hindi is the language uh, that will work. So we've requested uh, Kavita Krishnan to help us with the Hindi because our Hindi really is just hardly passable. And uh, for the friends who only know Kannada, uh, we've requested Vinesh Srinivasa from Bahutva Karnataka, who's, he's, uh, who's there, to also do the translation into Kannada. So first Mihir will speak in English, then we'll have a short translation into Hindi short translation to Kannada. I'd request you all to please stay and then we'll have an interaction with Mihir at the end of that. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Mihir. Thanks, uh, Clifton, for that embarrassing introduction. Uh, and thanks for inviting me here. And thank you all for being here at a time when uh, our, our country and Karnataka are facing some of the most trying times in the history of our independent nation. I was just uh, two days back uh, uh, no, about uh, just two days back, I was reading a very interesting play by a journalist called Saeed Nakwi. Uh, the play is called Vanishing Muslim. And the play begins with the premise that uh, one fine day, it is discovered that 200 million Muslims have disappeared from India. And then the play goes on to, uh, and, and suddenly, and they've disappeared with all their historical things, including the Red Fort and the, uh, uh, and the Kutub Minar and uh, the literature and the art and everything which, uh, and the food, including the, uh, the, the Mughalai food and whatever, whatever, you know, everything. 
and at initially there is a lot of uh, jubilation that uh, this has happened yeah, that so many muslims have uh, disappeared now we are a, now we are a, we have rid ourselves of muslims from this country and then as the play progresses okay, uh, the conflict i mean your main enemy is gone now what do you do okay how do you now continue with the the kind of politics which you are doing all this while okay and a conflict begins between the dalits and the upper caste and the the complete insecurity which comes within the upper uh, upper caste and at the end of the play the upper caste are demanding bring the muslims back you know uh, it's a very uh, a very fascinating play and this is something which is a reflection of our times the play reflects our times but moving on from that okay the topic for today namely countering the fascist assault and the role of legal community i will not go into the definitional conundrum conundrum of uh, whether it is fascist semi fascist authoritarian etc etc but we all experience what is going on we need not even get into the debate of what is, what is fascism what is not fascism etc etc we all are, are experiencing what is going on in the in our country today and what is going to be the role or what has been the role of especially progressive lawyers lawyers who speak of human rights okay what is what is going to be the role of these lawyers what has been the role of these lawyers in the last uh, couple of years and how it is going to be what are the challenges which are being thrown at us at the lawyers who espouse human rights in courts etc what are the newer challenges which they are facing what are the threats which they are facing as we all know some of the lawyers are in jail as we speak today in fact uh, and 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 again the whole question of the judiciary that how his how has the judiciary responded what can we expect from the judiciary okay, in the present times i think these are some of the aspects which i would like to discuss but before i go into that okay i just wanted to do a broad summary of the human rights lawyering which has happened in this country in the last 70 years a very very brief summary in order to realize the difference in the context today as it was from the earlier times okay. what are the different challenges we are facing today from the earlier times now if you see the post independence era human rights lawyering has always existed okay it has always existed it may have existed in different forms it may not have been called human rights lawyering it may not have been called cause lawyering it may not have been called public interest lawyering or whatever okay. but human but lawyering of, uh, on the issue of human rights existed right from the day the constitution came in and maybe even before that but i am just con confining myself to the constitution now if you look and there you divide the era between pre 78 and post 78 now if you look at the pre 78 era right from 1950 there were basically four or five issues on which human rights lawyering happened okay, before the 78 era one of the major issues okay, was labor labor laws if you see from 50s to 70s mid 70s of course it continues even today okay. but if you see from 50s to 70s one of the major issues on which progressive lawyering lawyering on the issues of human rights was on labor laws and the reason why it was on one of the reasons why it was on labor laws of course is immediately after independence you had a plethora of labor legislations coming into uh, being whether it be industrial disputes act provident fund act standing orders act 
bonus act this act. i mean plethora of industrial uh, 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 relations uh, plus the setting up of the industrial and labor tri tribunals and courts specialized industrial labor and tribunals in court so you had a situation like that some of the lawyers of the human rights movement uh, in terms of the in terms of legal lawyers okay, started their careers as labor lawyers if you see mr tanna biran for instance he started by representing mining work my mi mine workers you see indira jay singh for instance she was a labor lawyer i am glad mr subarao is here who himself has been a labor lawyer since a I don't know. I mean, since before possibly I was born, I, I always like to think I'm young. But uh, so then, uh, so so you had a whole generation of human rights lawyering very much focused on labor lawyering. Yeah. That is how it started. The other aspect on which human rights lawyering happened at that time was on freedom of speech and expression. while it initially started from romesh thapar's case in 1950 immediately after one of the first constitutional cases immediately after the constitution came in it subsequently for a period of 25 30 years was conducted essentially the issues concerning uh, freedom of speech and expression were taken over by the big media houses you have had the bennett coleman case you have the indian express case you have the sakal newspaper case arguing various things i'm basically on an issue of human rights namely freedom of speech and expression going from the initially starting from the issue whether freedom of speech is include whether freedom of press is included in freedom of speech and expression then going into the issue of indirect impact on freedom of speech like raising of uh, news print prices etc then going into the issue whether commercial speech is part of freedom of speech and expression so that that is the second line of things which happened up to 78 the third line of cases which happened at that point of time were basic, basically on rights of property again at that point of time the right of property as a fundamental right was canvassed essentially by the rich people by the zamindars against the zamindari abolition acts bank nationalization private banks privy purses cases uh, when they lost their privy purses so this was the line this was the other issues concerning fundamental rights which were agitated at that time and of course the fourth issue was the criminal law which people were always facing began right from 1950 51 with gopalan's case preventive detention and then continued bj rao's case i forgot to mention rao and reddy were also very very prominent uh, labor lawyers uh, uh, in the madras constituency at that time bj rao's case in various other cases concerning criminal law so this is the as far as the dalit rights issues are concerned in the pre 78 period the main issue concerning dalit rights which were agitated in the higher courts concerned reservation in jobs as well as education balaji's case devdasan's case etc etc these are the cases which were uh, agitated at uh, 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 agitated at but the other issues yeah, which we saw post 78 were not really that much in prominence before 78 all of us know that after 78 you had a dramatic change and on the one hand you had menaka gandhi's judgment which uh, uh, brought about the interlinkages between the fundamental rights you had certain supreme court judges justice krishna ayer chinappa reddy bhagwati da desai etc etc who took a very very active role in human rights jurisprudence including the issues of uh, uh, it started with prisoners rights bonded labor 
legal aid that was the early late 70s and uh, uh, mid 80s and then you had a, a whole range of issues concerning environmental law women's rights children's rights etc et so this is the human rights lawyering which was happening at that time and remember it was not only the judges who were progressive because of which this was happening this was also the time the post 78 time period was also the time when you had large number of mass movements happening you had the big trade union movements happening across the country you had a, a women's movement which uh, uh, which was gathering a new fervor at that uh, that point of time you had democratic uh, rights organizations starting across the country whether it be pucl pudr AP, apclc apdr <coughs> cpdr various civil liberties organizations you had also the beginnings of ngos the non governmental organization so it was a mixture of all this which led to the post 78 human rights jurisprudence and then of course as time passed this jurisprudence as well as the people struggles led to many many new laws including the prevention of atrocities act you had the domestic violence act you had the sexual harassment act which which came of course in the last decade right to information act disabilities act juvenile justice act so you have a plethora of legislations which came during that period and while it is true that no establishment or no government likes dissent okay? no government likes being challenged okay? the response to the challenge was somewhat of challenges of various kind response to various kind of accountability demands etc was muted so you had on the one hand right from the 70s beginning of early 70s you had on the one hand for instance in andhra pradesh a large number of cases concerning naxalites who were either arrested or who were killed in encounters etc that was happening in uh, early 70s but it was confined to one or two states it was not an all india phenomena which was happening at that point of time similarly you had the the tada the pota etc etc which came in and what you had up to 2012 is a mixture of very very populist laws you had some repressive laws draconian laws like the amended uapa and uh, nsa national security act etc and a combination of the two but you did not have what we see today as a targeted attacks targeted brutal attacks on those who espouse human rights those who espouse issues concerning marginalized communities okay these are the things which we did not have okay it it is this is what see even today if you see from 70 even even if you see from 2014 onwards okay even if you see from 2014 onwards what has happened is this the present government okay. as i as i mentioned even the earlier government was authoritarian it is not not that it was not authoritarian many cases of victimization took place police violence took place communal violence took place nobody was held accountable all this was happening okay. but there are three or four things in the present establishment present government 19 uh, 2014 onwards which i think we need to bear in mind in order to decide in order to in order to uh, you know analyze how the lawyering today okay, is going to be and is being different than what it was earlier 
Now, there is a threefold objective which the present establishment follows. Okay? There are three objectives, and all of that have an impact on how we do our lawyering, what are the challenges legally, what are the legal challenges, etc. The first is the establishment of Hindu Rashtra. That's the first one. That's one of the one of the main objectives that you uh, you want to establish a Hindu Rashtra, which by definition, okay, by definition, can mean only a highly patriarchal, communal, and caste state. Okay? You cannot. I mean, that is the only definition of Hindu Rashtra which one one, one can uh, you know. Uh, imagine, because I don't see any other definition of uh, uh, Hindu Rashtra. Basically, it has to be a, uh, uh, I mean, Hindu Rashtra in its actual practice would be a patriarchal, casteist, and communal, communal state. Second thing, just give me a minute. Second thing, it is a highly centralized state. You see, when you want to have a, what are you trying to do by having a Hindu Rashtra? You want to remove all kinds of multiculturalism. You are, you want to remove all kinds of plurality. You want to have one kind of, one kind of society, one kind of state. Okay. And you can't do it without centralized power extremely centralized power. That is, that, that is one thing which you, you have to bear in mind. The, and what I mean by that is that a quasi-federal nation, a state like us, constitutionally, okay, is being sought to be converted okay, into a much more centralized state. This can happen in various ways. I mean, just to give you an example, prior to the farmers' bills, which were, of course, a farmers act, which were, uh, they were forced to repeal. Okay. It was the state governments which were having various laws con uh, concerning agricultural produce, etc., etc. Various state governments had their various laws, various market committees, agriculture market committees, etc., etc. This was sought to be done away with by a centralized law, which was the farmers, which were the, the three farmers acts. Similarly, the GST. The goods and services tax was an attempt towards centralization of power, is an attempt towards centralization of power, of taxation. The, so this is the second thing which you see. And the third thing which they need is a strong security state. In order to achieve Hindu Rashtra, you need a strong security state, a, a, a state with a security apparatus which is extremely strong and which is answerable only to the central government. Just coming back to the earlier issue about centralization, one more example which I should have given is the whole question of use of NIE, National Investigating Agency. Ordinarily, law and order is a state subject. So the state police takes action when there is a law and order problem. CBI is a central agency which can investigate into state crimes also, provided the state government gives its consent to, the, to, uh, to, the, uh, to, to have an investigation carried out by the CBI. So you need the state government's consent. NIA, National Investigating Agency, is the only agency which can carry out investigation irrespective of whether the state is consenting to it or not. Okay. Of course, this was brought by, like, you know, many of the ills of the present government. Okay. This, this was Chidambaram's brainchild uh, in 19, uh, 2008, 2008 just as the UAP amendments were Chidambaram's uh, brainchild. So, the, uh, it's like uh, there is a, a famous uh, uh, 
sentence in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice when Shylock, who's a Jew, tells the, uh, uh, tells the other person that uh, the villainy you teach me, I shall execute. It will be hard, but I will better the instructions. The BJP seems to be telling the Congress that. That the villainy you uh, you teach me, I, I, I'll better I'll better the instruction. It will be hard, but I'll better your instructions. You know, that that that's what is what seems to be happening. But anyway, coming back, to, now, in order to achieve these goals okay, of Hindu Rashtra in centralized state security, uh, heavily secur uh, securitized state. They need to do three or four things, in which they have been doing. Okay. First is that you have to have laws and policies which marginalize the religious minorities. Okay. That's the first thing. You implement laws and policies which marginalize the religious minorities. Now, which are the laws and policies which are obvious to us? You look at CANRC, you look at the beef ban laws, you look at the conversion laws. You look at, look at even the hijab debate which uh, Karnataka, uh, which happened in Karnataka. These are the laws and policies okay, which are targeted at marginalizing the religious minorities. So that's one thing they need to do and which they have been doing. Second thing they need to do is And including 370, what they did in Kashmir, that is again towards that. Second thing is that increasing, the second thing is laws and policies which vest increasing power with the center. This is again, you see, what I talked about earlier that you had GST, you had NIA, you had, you had, uh, you have the PMLA Act, which is being used much more, the ED. Uh, ED being used much more, the farmers' bills. So these are the examples of uh, policies which best increasing power with the center. And the third is, which is very important for us, is quelling of dissent. And in order to quell dissent, have a surveillance state. Okay? Because you need to find out who is dissenting, why, uh, uh, when somebody is objecting to, how somebody is objecting to. So voices of dissent. So it becomes important if you want to have a centralized security, uh, uh, centralized police state, to ensure that you don't have voices of dissent at all coming out. And wherever these voices of dissent come out, crush them. So you target civil society activists. You target NGOs. NGOs you target by FCRA. Uh, you, uh, you, you let loose the FCRA regime on them and tell and uh, cancel their uh, FCRA registration, cancel their funding, etc. This has been happening with a large number of organizations. In the last two, three years, we have seen that. Activists are targeted. If you are a Muslim, you are called an uh, Islamist. If you are a non-Muslim, you will be called an urban Naxal. Okay. So uh, th this way target the uh, civil society. You target independent bureaucrats, which we have seen across the, you target independent academicians, which again is something which we have seen. You, we, have, we have seen this happening in various cases, whether it's in the Bhima Koregao cases, or the Delhi riots cases, or the case arrest of journalists, Hathras, etc. And various other cases, uh, Akhil Gogoi, recently you had seen the arrest of uh, uh, Jignesh Mevani, who was taken to Assam for some uh, some tweet okay. and you do this by using the existing laws but also introducing newer laws and implementing them such as the UID Aadhaar which was towards surveillance, diluting the Right to Information Act. Information technology rules, which recently uh, uh, have come up, then the new new law, which requires every accused in every uh, every accused in any offence to give their photographs, fingerprinting, 
all kinds of biological indicators, etc., etc. And the fourth and the last, what this government does in order to achieve its objectives is hollowing out the institutions of accountability. Whatever institutions of accountability are there are followed out. These institutes include the parliament. You haul out the parliament by passing any law you want as a money bill by uh, bypassing the Rajya Sabha. You do away effectively with the position of leader of opposition. You stop sending bills to standing committees where opposition uh, parties are also there. Then there is some kind of hearing that's following out of... So you, you hollow out the parliamentary process. You hollow out institutions such as the NHRC by amending the law to put your main in, man in place there, Justice Arun Mishra, who otherwise could not have been the chairperson because the law required that only a retired Chief Justice of the Supreme Court could be a uh, head of the NHRC. So you amend the law to make it any, any judge of the Supreme Court. Similarly, major attacks on all independent tribunals. We have seen the kind of bills which uh, the age of retirement, the term tenure, etc., etc., the terms and conditions which can be varied at any time. Those things are being brought in. You have hollowing out of even the CAG, the RBI, the election commission. I mean, I can go on and on, but the, so so. The, you completely hollow out all institutions of accountability and you hollow out all institutions of transparency. This is what they are doing. Now, and of course you try to influence in different ways the judiciary. Okay? Now remember one thing, okay, that when we talk about judiciary being influenced by what is happening in by, by the Home Ministry or by the PMO, okay, one is not talking necessarily about the Home Minister picking up the phone and talking to a judge. That's not how it works. There are various reasons why the judiciary gets influenced. First of all, remember, whenever there has been an overwhelming majority in Parliament, of any party, the judiciary has swung towards and has always, you know, given credence to the central government, whenever there has been, whether it was Indira Gandhi's time during emergency or whether it's today. Yeah. Whenever there is a majority, the, the judiciary swings towards that if, it, if people have given overwhelming majority to this particular party, then we must respect its actions. You know, that, 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 that happens at some level in their, at the back of their mind. Second thing which happens is that some of the judges have internalized, have internalized the actual agenda of the, part, of the party in power. Okay. Third thing is, of course, that the higher courts, especially, the opportunities, career opportunities post-retirement are much more now. And those career opportunities are not decided by the collegium of the Supreme Court, but decided by the central government or by the state government. Okay. So they are dependent on being in the good books of the central government or the state government, depending on where they are. And the lower judiciary, of course, for its promotion, for its continuation, for various things, is dependent on the government. So these are the kind of, uh, kind of reasons why, and, and some of the judges actually believe you know, in a strong security state. Okay. Some of the judges believe in that. Okay. Internal, they will internalize it. Okay. So, yes, there may be financial corruption. Yes, there may be some direct talk from, from a minister to a judge. 
but that is not the main reason why you have you see a swing in the judiciary the reasons can be many fold okay? it's not necessarily financial corruption or something or, or 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 direct pressure being brought there are various reasons why judges swing towards the other side but what we do see is that swing very market swing today especially in supreme court and high courts across the country there is no reason otherwise why cases like the abrogation of article 370 should remain pending till such time as it at any way works itself out at the at the ground level ca nrc over which there were so many massive protests why this that case has not been taken up nobody knows of course if ca nrc would have been called arnab goswami then it would have been taken up fast which is a different matter altogether okay similarly the political bonds case very important not being taken up not considered urgent the hijab controversy which has gone to supreme court ordinarily should have been taken up in the next day and uh, uh, and heard you know no urgency shown so one way of avoiding controversial decisions by the judiciary is of course not taking taking up those cases at all avoiding taking up the cases and that the indian judiciary is really a master in that art so uh, that's something which uh, judges know how to adjourn matters just as well as lawyers do but, uh, but uh, judges also know how to adjourn matters so that 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 is something which happens uh, very easily but what is what is important for us to understand okay in the context of what what is happening in the country what i mentioned just now is that no matter what the regime okay across the world okay, no matter what the regime they always need to use laws in order to laws and policies in order to implement what they want to achieve okay hitler's germany did not just come one day and say that uh, uh, start it, uh, start killing jews it happened through a process of various legislations which took over a period of 7 8 years where first jews were uh, removed as citizens then they were removed as uh, uh, then they were asked to uh, wear a star then they were their houses were marked then they were removed from government and employment etc etc but all this was done through laws apartheid in south africa worked through laws and that's the and that becomes an interesting point because all the all the authoritarian regimes they require predictability they require some kind of a routine and they require their functionaries to know exactly what to do and that can only be done if there is a law and therefore even the worst regimes in the world always operate through constitutions and laws and that's when lawyers come in that because they operate through uh, through constitution and laws okay, lawyers would always have a scope okay, to go to courts and to argue matters and this has happened in as clifton was mentioning even in germany the lawyers were standing up to the regime but if you look at some of the other other regimes other because up till now we used to read holsbury's laws of england and the us supreme court etc etc cases but i think for the progressive lawyers it's very important now to look at how lawyers in countries such as south africa when it was an apartheid regime say a country such as chile when pinochet was really uh, ruling countries such as israel even now countries such as iran even now how these how how lawyers have operated in these countries and there are enough works available okay to uh, i mean you look at i mean i'll just give you one or two examples okay you look at uh, for instance uh, iran there is an there is a famous 
जज देर इन सेवेंटी एट कॉल शेरी नबादी शेरी नबादी वॉज रिमूव एज अ जज बिकॉज वंस द खोबियानी केम टू पावर इट वॉज डिसाइडेड दैट वीमेन के नॉट बी जजेस सो शी वॉज रिमूव एज अ जज सो शी स्टार्टेड प्रैक्टिसिंग शी स्टार्टेड प्रैक्टिसिंग एंड शी हैड आई मीन इवन देन शी वॉज इग्नोर्ड द लॉज वॉर वेरी बैड एक्सेट्रा सो आउटसाइड हर her her chamber she put up a board and the board read this way that due to the current inhospitable inhospitable circumstances of the courts i will no longer be accepting clients and can only offer legal advice this is what she did so she said it's meaningless going to courts i am not going to do that after after 6 months 8 months 1 year she realized it was it, it was not really achieving anything so she started going back to the court and she started of course it's another matter that shirin abadi she got a nobel prize her husband was arrested and threatened with shooting sister was arrested she herself was nearly arrested and finally she had to leave the country okay. that's what happened to shirin even in israel for instance and when i'm talking about israel i'm talking about occupied palestine and uh, uh, and various other uh, other places where people, palestinians live there was a time when the lawyers came to the conclusion that going to court is meaningless they came to the conclusion going to court is meaningless and some of them decided let's just boycott courts but then the persons the affected persons the victim said sorry you cannot do this you have to approach the court you have to go to court you have to fight that's that's one place available for us to fight it out and don't take away that place please fight out and they fought out okay. and you have a series of lawyers you have a series of books by, uh, i mean and uh, uh, michael fair fair I, i i can never pronounce his name uh, uh, felicia langer lia zafar these are lawyers who have spent their entire life in fighting these are jewish lawyers in israel who spend their entire life in fighting causes of palestinian occupied people okay. and they said that yes it's not that we have won some great battles but we have been able to somehow okay, reduce the impact of the israeli forces whether it um, whether in terms of the torture whether in terms of deportations whether in terms of uh, uh, building fences they have been able to do these things similarly if you look at uh, if you read the autobiography of uh, navi pillai who was a judge of the natal province of supreme court and who started her practice in 50s she was the first woman lawyer first woman judge etc etc black uh, uh, black woman of colored indian of indian origin worked during apartheid times lot of problems but she continued to use the courts and all of them felt all of them all of these people and and these are regimes which are extremely authoritarian regimes okay? extremely authoritarian regimes so if you if you see if you take their examples and see what is happening in india today it is very important the role of lawyers becomes very very important because even the present government when it start, of course it unleashes its militia the lynchings and all that all those things do happen but if you see the present uh, uh, i mean even the present government okay, it operates to target the marginalized communities as well as the voices of those communities like the civil society activists etc by using law one may call it one may call it misuse of law i don't call it misuse of law i feel for instance uapa i feel is meant for the purpose of targeting and so it's not misuse it's use of uapa yeah, there's no misuse but whatever one calls it misuse use whatever it is they use laws in order to target the marginalized communities as well as uh the as well as the non marginalized i mean the voices of this marginalized and there the scope for lawyers okay 
because lawyers have two, two, there are two situations in which lawyers come in. One is somebody is put in jail, somebody is about to be put in jail. That time you have no choice as a lawyer but to represent that person. You can't tell, give that person a lesson in jurisprudence, human rights jurisprudence, correct? I mean, you have to say that, okay, I, how do I best get you out of jail? Yeah, that's, that's one way. The other is in issues where you use the courts in order to further certain rights, okay? to further certain, certain rights, in order to challenge certain legislation, challenge certain administrative actions. That's the other thing. Now, it is true. It is true that one has to be ready for a lot more defeats okay, than successes in the present times. Because as I told you, the judiciary itself is not necessarily okay, operating in a manner very responsive to the civil society. It's not, uh, not, oper not, not operating in that manner. Okay. You have people lying in jail for eight years together. You have, uh, you have somebody who is in jail for the last, last two years for the simple reason, uh, 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 though he, had, he was nowhere in the picture at, uh, as far as uh, Delhi is concerned, his bail application is going on right now. He was not, when, not present in Delhi when the riots took place. He had nothing to do with violence, etc., etc. Still in jail for two years. So that kind of a situation you are going to meet. And more and more that kind of a situation you are going to meet. But I, you know, it's like that. It's like this, that uh, ultimately for human rights lawyers, for lawyers who are fighting for these causes, it becomes very, very important not to lose heart. Again, as Michael... What uh, the Israeli lawyer says that success and victory don't confuse between. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, they're two different things. I may succeed or lose in a case. That doesn't mean I have lost the cause. Okay? The cause gets advanced by various things. Like look at what it, look look at how the Supreme Court, because of the kind of campaigns which are going on, kind of cases it is getting on the on the issue of sedition had to take some kind of a strong steps to say, I mean, one may not agree with wholeheartedly with what it did, but at the same time, it is much more than what it has done in the past so many years on, on the issue of sedation. You know? They don't file any new, I mean, requested don't file new cases, etc., etc. That's a result of the kind of campaign which goes on inside and outside the courts. And that's where it, it's very important, I feel, for lawyers in the present times not to be purely lawyers, one has to be integrated, one has to engage with the civil society, with the movements which are happening outside because you are not just representing an individual case, you are representing a cause. And that cause, and see, legal profession is a very egotistic profession in the sense that, uh, I mean, uh, we always feel that we know what is best for the client, yeah. which is normally not the case, yeah. uh, as far as lawyers go. Okay. So we normally feel we know what is best for the clients, okay. because we have, we have the skills of argument, we have the skills of leading, leading some crazy, ponderous judgments. Uh, we have those skills. Okay. So we feel that we know what, what is best for, the, best for the clients, but normally that is, that, that is not the case. And therefore, it's very important, especially in the present time, especially when you are representing a cause or a movement or something like that, or civil society organization, to see what they want. Okay. It's, that's very important. The last thing which I wanted to mention was one of the issues which always comes up. Okay. Is, is the present government likely to overhaul the entire constitution? in order to bring about the changes it wants to bring about. One issue which always comes up. Are they likely to scrap the constitution? Are they likely to overhaul it completely, make major amendments? My answer would be a very cautious no. And the reason why I feel they don't require to do that. Please remember, in the last 10 years, they have brought in only four 
substantial amendments to the constitution. First amendment which they brought in was NJSC, that is the Judicial Commission, uh, which they wanted to bring in, which was struck down by the Supreme Court, so that's number one. Number two was GST, okay, which they brought in through a constitutional amendment. Number three was EBC, that is uh, economically backward section, 10% reservation. And number four was Kashmir 370. Okay. This is what they brought about by constitutional amendments. Everything else, they did not need a constitutional amendment. Whether it is the CA and RC, they did not change Articles 5 to 8 of the Constitution at all. They brought in CA and RC. Whether they wanted to bring in the uh, anti-conversion laws, they did not change the Constitution for that. They brought in. Labor codes have been changed. Four new labor codes have come in. They didn't change the Constitution. They did not have to change the Constitution. They brought in the labor codes. Farmers' bill, again, they did not need to change the Constitution. It's one thing, it's another thing that they repealed those bills because of the uh, tremendous pressure and tremendous movement of the farmers. But they did not have to amend the Constitution for that. So they don't need, please understand, Constitution is a document which can be interpreted in two, three ways. We may say that this is the spirit of the constitution and this is the correct way interpretation of the constitution. Ultimately, the interpretation of con the constitution depends on what the Supreme Court says. And till that time, they feel that the Supreme Court is not really going to harass them much, the central government, in terms of bringing in some major constitutional principles in order to strike down laws. They are not really going to change the constitution, especially because right now they need the Dalit votes and any major change in constitution would be seen as doing away with what Ambedkar did. Okay. So that, that's, that's another reason why. So, so I don't think they, they, need, they need to do that. Even on, say for instance, hijab controversy. You have the freedom of, you have the, you have the non-discrimination article 14. You have the freedom of choice, free speech, expression, Article 19. You have right to life and personal liberty, Article 21. You have freedom of religion, Article 25. Despite all this, you saw what the Karnataka High Court judge, uh, judges did. They did not need any changes in the Constitution in order to do that. So, so, but that situation can change if tomorrow the Supreme Court decides to interpret the Constitution in its true spirit and strikes down certain laws, then they might decide to change the constitution, which is a different, different. but, I, but uh, looking at the present Supreme Court, I think that's a daydream, you know, to think that this present Supreme Court is going to have some ma major changes in, uh, in the constitution. I don't think that's, I, 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 uh, is going to interpret the uh, constitution in a, in a much radical way. So that's one thing. So ultimately coming back to uh, the, the, the final question, that is what do lawyers these are the challenges before the lawyers today. You know? The challenges before the lawyers are that you, are, you have an increasingly authoritarian government which does not even stop at civil society but will also, is also targeting lawyers. As we know, some lawyers are already in jail. Some lawyers are being threatened. So that's, that's one challenge which, is, uh, which we are facing. The second challenge is, of course, the, because of the kind of laws which are brought in and because it operates from, through laws, the lawyers will always have opportunities of challenging various actions in the court of law. Okay. And as progressive lawyers, we should all take up those opportunities Try to expand them as much as possible. Use the constitution. Are you on the basis of the constitution in court? Are you on the basis of human rights jurisprudence in court? Are you on the basis? I mean, ultimately, we need legitimacy for what we argue. So, are you on the basis of international? Much more of international law will need to be used. International instruments will need to be used while arguing. And I think I think that's something. That's a challenge which we are we are facing. Of course, the challenges are very harsh. Challenges are very, very, you know, strong challenges which we'll be facing. But I am an eternal optimist because I, 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 I think we, are, we all are capable of taking up those challenges and dealing with the 
scenario which we are facing, which is an extremely, uh, as the topic suggests, uh, we are dealing with a fascist state, which doesn't, we doesn't necessarily believe in rule of law. At the same time, it is difficult for them to do away with the constitution. It's difficult for them to do away with at least the facade of democracy. And till such time as the facade of democracy remains, we have to use it to the extent possible in order to ensure that we are able to agitate the rights of people in the courts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mir. I think this journey of from rule of law by what we are seeing today of rule by law, I think it's extremely informative and inspiring. We will need some translations, so I request everyone to please bear with us. We will have short translations in Hindi and a short translation in Kannada. I request uh, Kavita to please uh, just translate into Hindi and then Vinay, if you can be ready to translate into Kannada. एक सेकेंड इसको थोड़ा सा एडजस्ट कर दी संक्षिप्त में कर दे रही हूँ हिंदी में मेहर देसाई की बात को उन्होंने कहा कि हमारे देश में और कर्नाटका में दोनों में इस समय बहुत कठिन माहौल है और कुछ दिनों पहले के उन्होंने सईद नकवी का उस नाटक को देखा जहाँ पे एक मुसलमान मुक्त भारत की कल्पना की गई जहाँ पे अगर अचानक एक दिन उठ करके देखा गया कि सारे मुसलमान उठ के चले गए और उस उनके साथ वो संस्कृति खाना खान पान सब कुछ उठा के ले गए तो ये देश कैसा होगा तो वहाँ से वो शुरू किए और उन्होंने कहा कि पिछले कुछ वर्षों में प्रगतिशील वकीलों के लिए और वकालत के पेशे में जितने लोग हैं उनके लिए किस तरह के चैलेंजेस हैं उसके बारे में किस तरह की चुनौतियां हैं उसके बारे में वो बोले तो उन्होंने कहा कि आ, 1978 से पहले के दौर में अगर हम देखते हैं तो चार तरह के मानवाधिकार के क्षेत्र में चार तरह की आ, तरह के इस तरह के ह्यूमन राइट्स इंटरवेंशंस देखे गए कानून के क्षेत्र में पहला कि लेबर लॉ के क्षेत्र में आ, दूसरा जो आ, बोलने के अधिकार के क्षेत्र में तीसरा जो राइट टू प्रॉपर्टी के क्षेत्र में जो कि ज़मींदार लोगों ने ज़्यादा चैलेंज किया आ, एक तरह से ज़मींदारी एबोल्यूशन के कानून वगैरह को चौथा क्रिमिनल लॉ के क्षेत्र में उसके कुछ उदाहरण उन्होंने दिए और दलित आ, अधिकारों के मामले में प्री नाइनटीन मेनली आरक्षण के क्षेत्र में आ, जो केसेस थे वो देखे गए 1978 के बाद में उन्होंने देखा कि एक बड़ा चेंज देखा गया वहाँ पर जो केसेस थे उसमें बहुत सारे ऐसे जजेस भी देखे गए जिन्होंने एक तरह से ह्यूमन राइट्स के सवालों में में जो जेल में जो लोग हैं या बॉन्डेड लेबर है या महिलाओं के अधिकार हैं एनवायरमेंटल लॉ है बहुत सारे जन आंदोलन है ट्रेड यूनियन आंदोलन है महिला आंदोलन है आ, उन सब का उस उन उस सारे माहौल का जो रिफ्लेक्शन है वो बहुत सारे केसेस में देखे गए और उसके तहत बहुत सारे नए कानून बनते हुए देखे गए जैसे प्रिवेंशन ऑफ एट्रॉसिटीज़ एक्ट हो डोमेस्टिक वायलेंस एक्ट हो आ, महिलाओं पर हिंसा से रिलेटेड बहुत सारे कानून हो जे जे एक्ट हो आरटीआई वगैरह वगैरह तो उन्होंने कहा कि अगर हम कहते कोई भी सरकार एक तरह से अपने को दी गई चुनौती नहीं पसंद करती लेकिन फिर भी उस चुनौती में रेस्पॉन्स देखा गया तो अलग अलग सरकारों की अलग अलग रही हैं और सत्तर के दशक में जो बहुत सारे केसेस थे ये नक्सलाइट से जुड़े हुए केसेस थे टाडा पोटा के केसेस बाद में आए और 2012 तक देखा गया तो हाँ इस तरह के बहुत सारे आ, जिनको कहा जाता है दमनकारी कानून काले कानून तो यू ए पी एमेंडेड यू वगैरह वो आए लेकिन वो उस तरह के कानून नहीं थे जो खास करके ह्यूमन राइट्स डिफेंडर्स को जो लोग मानवाधिकार को बचाते हैं उनको टारगेट करने वाले या मार्जिनलाइज कम्युनिटी को टारगेट करने वाले कानून उस तरह के नहीं थे 2014 के बाद से जो सरकार रही है इससे पहले की 2014 से पहले की जो सरकार थी 
उस उसके यहाँ भी सारी चीज़ें सांप्रदायिक हिंसा हो पुलिस हिंसा हो सारी चीज़ें जवाबदेही की कमी हो वो सब कुछ तब भी था उसमें सब कुछ हुआ लेकिन ये जो सरकार 2014 से आई है उसमें तीन उसके ऑब्जेक्टिव्स इन्होंने गिनाया पहला हिंदू राष्ट्र को बनाना जो कि पितृसत्तात्मक होगी सांप्रदायिक होगी जातिवादी होगी दूसरा बहुत ही केंद्रीकृत एक राज्य को बनाना जो कि पूरा जो एक बहु बहुत्वता है उसको ख़त्म करके बनाना इसको और तीसरा एक बहुत ही स्ट्रॉन्ग एक सिक्योरिटी राज्य को बनाना जो कि सिर्फ और सिर्फ केंद्र सरकार के प्रति ही जवाबदेह होगी और इसके उदाहरण उन्होंने दिया और उन्होंने कहा कि हाँ इसमें अगर देखा जाए तो कुछ चीज़ें जैसे एन का इस्तेमाल ये चीज़ें देखा जाए तो चिदम्बरम ले आए लेकिन जो मौजूदा सरकार है वो चिदम्बरम से हो सकता है ये कह रही हो मर्चेंट ऑफ वेनिस की भाषा में कि जो क्रूरता आप हमें जो क्रूरता आपने हमें सिखाया वो शायद मुश्किल हो लेकिन हो सकता है आपने हमें जो सीख दिया उससे कहीं बेहतर हम काम करके दिखा दें आपको तो ये उन्होंने बताया उसी तरह से उन्होंने कहा कि ये बहुत सारे नए जो चीज़ें ला रहे हैं नए कानून ला रहे हैं उसमें एक सेट कानून वो जो कि माइनॉरिटीज़ को अल्पसंख्यक समुदाय को टारगेट करने वाले सी ए एन आर सी बीफ बैन हिजाब पर रोक एंटी कन्वर्जन लॉ आर्टिकल 370 दूसरा जो है वो कानून जो कि अब बहुत सारे ऐसे कानून जो कि सत्ता का केंद्रीकरण कर पाने में सफल हो तीसरा जो है वो जो कि पूरे जितने नागरिक हैं उन पर निगरानी रखने वाले और उस उनमें उनके डिसेंट पर दमन करने वाले एक तरह से दमन करने वाले तो उसमें तमाम सिविल सोसाइटी तमाम तरह के लोगों पे या ब्यूरोक्रेट्स पे या पढ़ाई लिखाई करने वालों पर या जर्नलिस्ट पर तमाम लोगों पर रोक करने वाले कानून चौथा जो है जो इंस्टीट्यूशंस हैं उनको एक तरह से जवाबदेही उनकी ख़त्म कर देना और उन पर पारदर्शिता ख़त्म करने वाले तमाम संस्थाओं में और इसमें वो कई सारे उदाहरण उन्होंने दिखाया ठीक है इसमें वो वो पूछ रहे हैं कि जो जो जुडिशरी है जो न्याय व्यवस्था है उसमें किस तरह का वो रहा है तो ये अगर हम सवाल पूछें कि जजों को क्या इन्फ्लुएंस किया जा सकता है तो मामला ये नहीं है कि कोई फ़ोन करके किसी जज को कहेगा कि आप ऐसा करो आप वैसा करो बात वो नहीं है बात ये है कि वो जो व्यवस्था है जो संस्था है जुडिशरी की वो अपने आप में जो एजेंडा है हो सकता है वो उसको अपने आप में खुद ही अपने अंदर ले लें और वैसा काम करें हो सकता है कि रिटायरमेंट के बाद के जो करियर अपॉर्चुनिटीज़ हैं उसको देख करके वो काम करें हो सकता है कि कुछ जज ऐसे हों जो सचमुच वो विश्वास करें कि भाई बहुत स्ट्रांग सिक्योरिटी स्टेट होना चाहिए और इसलिए मुझे ऐसा करना चाहिए वगैरह डायरेक्ट इन्फ्लुएंस डायरेक्टली फ़ोन करके करना ये कोई ज़रूरी नहीं हो कि वैसा हो जैसे अगर हम पूछें कि 2019 से लेकर के अब तक आर्टिकल 370 का एब्रोगेशन के जो केस हैं उसकी सुनवाई सुप्रीम कोर्ट में क्यों नहीं चल रही है तो उसका आंसर सिर्फ ये नहीं हो सकता है कि किसी ने फ़ोन कर दिया है कोई दूसरी वजह भी है सी ए एन आर सी के केसेस जो हैं उसमें सुनवाई क्यों नहीं है और वो अर्णब गोस्वामी केस अगर होगा तो उसकी सुनवाई जल्दी होगी नहीं तो नहीं होगा ये क्या मामला है आ, इस तरह के उदाहरण उन्होंने दिया और बाकी अगर हम आ, 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 उन्होंने कहा कि वकीलों को ये सोचना चाहिए कि आ, हमें तमाम जो हिटलर के ज़माने में किस तरह से वकीलों ने काम किया हमें और भी उदाहरण लेने चाहिए साउथ अफ्रीका में चिले में इसराइल में ईरान में कैसे वकीलों ने काम किया इनमें से ईरान में से तो जो महिला जज रही बाद में वो महिला वकील के रूप में काम करी श्री नेबादी नोबेल पाई लेकिन उनको बाद में ईरान छोड़ना पड़ा ऐसे भी उदाहरण हैं लेकिन हम लोगों को ये याद रखना चाहिए कि जो अभी की जो सरकार है वो कानूनों का इस्तेमाल करती है और यू का कानून इस्तेमाल करती है वो अभी भी उसको कानून की ज़रूरत है वो भले ही रूल ऑफ लॉ ना माने लेकिन कानून बनाने का की ज़रूरत उसको है और इसमें हम लोगों को ये याद रखना चाहिए उम्मीद अपनी बनाए रखना ज़रूरी है हमें सक्सेस में यानी हम जिस केस को लड़ रहे हैं उसमें हमको सफलता मिल जाए उस सफलता में और हम जिस आ, आ, जिस कॉज के लिए लड़ रहे हैं 
जिस चीज के लिए लड़ रहे हैं उसको आगे बढ़ाने में जो सफलता है दोनों में फर्क हमको समझना चाहिए जो कि इसराइल के लॉयर माइकल स्फार्ड ने जो कहा ये याद रखना चाहिए जैसे उन्होंने कहा कि सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने जो सेडिशन के बारे में अभी कहा हो सकता है वो हमको कम लगे वो उतना ना लगे जो हम जिसकी हमें उम्मीद थी लेकिन वो इसलिए हो पाया है एक जबरदस्त आंदोलन के के कारण जो कि कोर्ट्स के अंदर भी बाहर भी लड़ा गया है तो वो जब जब हम लॉयर हैं तो हम सिर्फ किसी इंडिविजुअल के लिए नहीं लड़ रहे हैं हम एक आंदोलन का हिस्सा जब बनते हैं तब हम इस काम को बेहतर कर पाते हैं और हम सिर्फ अपने एक इंडिविजुअल लॉयर बन करके सिर्फ एक एक अपने बारे में नहीं सोच रहे हैं बल्कि हम और ख़ास करके इस समय ऐसा सोचना बहुत ज़रूरी है एक सवाल अक्सर लोग पूछते हैं कि क्या भी जो मौजूदा सरकार है वो पूरे संविधान को ख़त्म कर देगी और इन्होंने कहा कि मेरा जवाब है कि मैं थोड़ा सा सोच समझ करके कहूँगा कि शायद नहीं क्योंकि उनकी उनको ज़रूरत नहीं है ऐसा करने का ये देख लीजिए कि पिछले दस साल में वो सिर्फ चार बार कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल अमेंडमेंट ले आए हैं इसलिए क्योंकि संविधान को इंटरप्रेट किया जाना होता है और वो सुप्रीम कोर्ट को करना पड़ता है इंटरप्रेट और जब तक इनको कॉन्फिडेंस है कि सुप्रीम कोर्ट वो संविधान को इस तरह से इंटरप्रेट नहीं करेगी ट्रू स्पिरिट में जिससे कि वो जो कानून हम ला रहे हैं उनको स्ट्राइक डाउन कर दें तब तक उनको कोई ज़रूरत नहीं है कि वो संविधान को एक तरह से ख़त्म कर दें और संविधान के दायरे मैंने संविधान को रख करके उनको काम करना हो रहा है तो हमारे सामने जो चुनौतियां हैं वो ये है कि हाँ ये लॉयर्स को टारगेट करेंगे लॉयर्स को जेल भेजेंगे हो सकता है उससे ज़्यादा खराब करें लेकिन हाँ वकीलों के लिए अपॉर्चुनिटीज़ भी हैं हमारे लिए मौके भी हैं और इसमें हमको हर मौके का इस्तेमाल करना चाहिए कोर्ट्स में अपनी बात को कहने का अंतर्राष्ट्रीय कानून का भी इस्तेमाल करने का अंतर्राष्ट्रीय जो इंस्ट्रूमेंट्स है उसको भी इस्तेमाल करने का संविधान का तमाम चीज़ों का इस्तेमाल करने का और इन्होंने अंत में ये कहा कि मैं हमेशा पूरे उम्मीद से भरा रहता हूँ मैं मैं और मुझे लगता है कि जब तक इस सरकार को लोकतंत्र का एक तरह से दिखावा ही सही लेकिन लोकतंत्र का दिखावा जरूरी है इस सरकार के लिए तो उसका हम भरपूर इस्तेमाल करें उसमें एक तरह से असली लोकतंत्र के लिए लड़ने का पूरे मौके रहेंगे और उस उन मौकों का हम पूरा इस्तेमाल करें Vinay, I'm going to request Vinay to do a very brief translation into Kannada. Then, if there are any questions or any clarifications, we'll take it. Sangathi kalle na no. Samayda abava dinda sankshipt vagi na no anuvada marthen na. Auru lawyer gada patra yeni dae fascist dali na idhar sodrali an theedak munche ondo sanna hinale kotro. Ado just sankshipt vagi helthen na. और इवती ना पर्थित नालाक अंश मुख्यवाद प्रभुत्व मोदन हिंदू राष्ट्र न जारी तक बर के नोड़ता है एरने देश समाज दल ऐन बहुत्व इो भाषे संस्कृति धर्म अद्ने तेजे हरटे मूरने स्ट्रांग सेक्यूरीटी स्टेट भद्रते हर बेरेबेरे सर्वाधिकार कानून तक बर आधार तक बर आरता नाकने एन ई ए एन ई ए उपयोगको समाज दी सामिक कार्यकर्त बंदे भय तरह होरटदार अंत सो नाकू मे हिंदू राष्ट्र तक बर बहुत्व तेयोदे और अरे मोदलने अलसंख्यात गुरी मंत कानून तरता अब बीफ मेले वो दाड़ी अब एन आर सी इबूद आंटी कन्वर्शन लाजीबू अद एरने केंद्रीकृत वाद प्रभुत्व तक बर जी एस टी पी एम एल ए आर कानून तक बरतार मूरने आगे हेदे आधार अथवा बेरे नमेल कण्डोदे कानून अस्त्र उपयोग अद्ने उपयोगस्ता मत ऐन एन जी ओगे और मेले एफ सी आर ए आर कानून उपयोगको एन जी ओ मेले सह वो निग इक ट्रई मैं कोने जवाबारी संस्थे होणेगारिक संस्थे पार्लीमेंट इबू एन एच आर सी इबूद अवने बलहनगे वीकन मत जज्जू सह नहीं नोड़े यार रीति तीर्पल को जज्जा निवृत्त आदमे ये पोस्टिंग तक ऐन अदर आधार मेले तीर्पन को लॉयर पात्र बंदा और मुख्यवाद्र वो ना गमन इटको यदे वो सर्वाधिकार प्रभुत्व अब इसरेलो 
ಸೌತ್ ಆಫ್ರಿಕಾ ಇರ್ಬೋದು ಅಪಾರ್ಥೈಡ್ ಟೈಮಲ್ಲಿ ಬೇರೆ ಯಾವುದೇ ಸರ್ವಾಧಿಕಾರದ ಪ್ರಭುತ್ವ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಕಾನೂನುಗಳು ಬೇಕು ಸರ್ವಾಧಿಕಾರ ತಗೊಂಡು ಬರೋದಕ್ಕೆ ಕಾನೂನುಗಳು ಬೇಕು ಒಂದು ಸಂವಿಧಾನ ಬೇಕಾಗುತ್ತೆ ಇಲ್ಲಾಂದರೆ ಅವ್ರಿಗೂ ಸಹ ಕಂಟ್ರೋಲ್ ಇರೋದಿಲ್ಲ ಸೊ ಹಾಗಾಗಿ ಲಾಯರ್ಗಳಿಗೆ ಯಾವಾಗಲೂ ಸ್ಕೋಪ್ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಮತ್ತು ಅವ್ರು ಹೇಳಿದ್ದು ನಾವು ಲಾಯರ್ಸ್ ಆಗಿ ನಾವು ಇಸ್ರೇಲಲ್ಲಿ ಈಗ ಲಾಯರ್ಗಳು ಯಾವ ರೀತಿ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಸೌತ್ ಆಫ್ರಿಕಾದಲ್ಲಿ ಅಲ್ಲಿನ ಜನರ ಮೇಲೆ ಒಂದು ತಾರತಮ್ಯ ಮಾಡ್ತಿರ್ಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ಯಾವ ರೀತಿ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡಿದ್ರು ಇರಾನಲ್ಲಿ ಯಾವ ರೀತಿ ಕೆಲಸ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಇವನ್ನೆಲ್ಲ ನಾವು ಗಮನಿಸಬೇಕು ಅಂತ ಅವ್ರು ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ಉದಾಹರಣೆಗೆ ಅವ್ರು ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ಇಸ್ರೇಲಲ್ಲಿ ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಜನ ಲಾಯರ್ಸು ನಾವು ಕೋರ್ಟ್ನ ಬಹಿಷ್ಕಾರ ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ಅಂತ ಆಗ ಅವ್ರ ಕ್ಲೈಂಟ್ಸ್ ಯಾರು ಈ ಥರ ಅವ್ರು ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ಇಲ್ಲ ನೀವು ಬಹಿಷ್ಕಾರ ಮಾಡೋಂಗಿಲ್ಲ ಯಾಕೆಂದರೆ ನಮ್ಗೆ ಇರೋದು ಇದೊಂದೇ ದಾರಿ ಇರೋದು ಸೊ ನೀವು ಇದನ್ನು ನೀವು ಬಹಿಷ್ಕಾರ ಮಾಡಿಬಿಟ್ರೆ ನಮಗೆ ತುಂಬ ಕಷ್ಟ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಹಾಗಾಗಿ ನೀವು ಬಹಿಷ್ಕಾರ ಮಾಡೋಂಗಿಲ್ಲ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ಸೊ ಹಾಗಾಗಿ ಅವ್ರು ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ಮಾಡಬೇಕಾಯ್ತು ಸೊ ಅವ್ರು ಕಂಟಿನ್ಯೂ ಮಾಡಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ಒಂದು ಎಕ್ಸಾಂಪಲ್ ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ನಾವು ಸಕ್ಸಸ್ ಮತ್ತು ವಿಕ್ಟ್ರಿ ಇದೆರಡು ನೋಡಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ಎರಡು ಬೇರೆ ಬೇರೆ ಪದ ನಾವು ಕೋರ್ಟಲ್ಲಿ ಒಂದು ವೇಳೆ ಸೋತ್ರೂ ಸಹ ಆದರೆ ನಾವು ಯಾವ ಕಾಸ್ಗೋಸ್ಕರ ನಾವು ಹೋರಾಟ ಮಾಡೋದಲ್ಲ ಆ ಕಾಸ್ ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಮುಂದೆ ಹೋಗ್ಬೋದು ಸೊ ಹಾಗಾಗಿ ನಾವು ಕೋರ್ಟಲ್ಲಿ ಸೋತ್ರೆ ಮಾತ್ರ ನಾವು ಸೋತಿದ್ದೀವಿ ಅಂತ ನಾವು ಅಂದ್ಕೋಬಾರ್ದು ಸೊ ಆ ರೀತಿ ಇಸ್ರೇಲಿ ಲಾಯರ್ಗಳು ಸಹ ಆ ರೀತಿ ಅದನ್ನು ನೋಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಅದರದ್ದು ಸಹ ಒಂದು ಎಕ್ಸಾಂಪಲ್ ಕೊಟ್ಟರು ಮತ್ತು ಇನ್ನೊಂದು ಅವ್ರೇನು ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ಅಂದರೆ ನಾವು ಲಾಯರ್ಗಳಾಗಿ ಮೂರು ಥರ ಮಾಡ್ಬೋದು ಒಂದು ಜೈಲ್ಗೆ ಹೋಗಿರೋರು ಅಥವಾ ಜೈಲಲ್ಲಿ ಇರೋರು ಅವ್ರನ್ನ ಬಿಡಿಸೋದು ಹೇಗೆ ಅನ್ನೋದು ಒಂದು ಎರಡನೇದು ಎನ್ ಆರ್ ಸಿ ಅಂತ ಕಾನೂನುಗಳು ತೊಗೊಂಡು ಬಂದಾಗ ಅದನ್ನು ಚಾಲೆಂಜ್ ಮಾಡೋದಿರ್ಬೋದು ಮೂರನೇದು ಹಕ್ಕುಗಳಿಗೋಸ್ಕರ ನಾವು ವಾದ ಮಾಡಿ ಮುಂದೆ ತೊಗೊಂಡು ಹೋಗೋದು ಈ ಮೂರು ಸಹ ಮಾಡಬೇಕಾಗತ್ತೆ ಬಟ್ ಮೂರು ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ನಾವು ಮುಖ್ಯವಾಗಿ ಏನು ನೆನ್ಪಿಟ್ಕೋಬೇಕು ಅಂದರೆ ನಾವು ಒಂದು ಆಶೆನ ಕಳ್ಕೊಬಾರ್ದು ಒಂದು ಹೋಪ್ನ ಕಳ್ಕೊಬಾರ್ದು ಅಂತ ಅವ್ರು ತುಂಬ ಸ್ಪಷ್ಟವಾಗಿ ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ಸಂವಿಧಾನ ತಿದ್ದುಪಡಿ ಪ್ರಕ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಅವ್ರೇನು ಹೇಳಿದ್ದು ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿದ್ರೆ ನೋಡಿ ನನಗನ್ಸುತ್ತೆ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಕೋರ್ಟ್ ಯಾವಾಗ ತನಕ ಕೇಂದ್ರ ಸರ್ಕಾರಕ್ಕೆ ಯಾವ ಥರ ತೀರ್ಪುಗಳು ಬೇಕೋ ಕೊಡ್ತಾ ಇರೋ ತನಕ ಅವರು ಸಂವಿಧಾನ ಬದಲಾಯಿಸೋಕ್ಕೆ ಹೋಗೋದಿಲ್ಲ ಯಾಕೆಂದರೆ ಸುಪ್ರೀಂ ಕೋರ್ಟು ಅವ್ರಿಗೆ ಬೇಕಾಗಿರೋ ಹಂಗೆ ತೀರ್ಪುಗಳು ಕೊಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಸೊ ಸಂವಿಧಾನ ಈಗ ಬದಲಾಯಿಸೋಕ್ಕೆ ಹೋಗದೇ ಇರ್ಬೋದು ಅವ್ರು ತಂದಿರೋ ಅಮೆಂಡ್ಮೆಂಟ್ಸು ನೀವು ನೋಡಿದ್ರೆ ಜಿ ಎಸ್ ಟಿ ಎಕ್ನಾಮಿಕ್ಲಿ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ವರ್ಡ್ ಕ್ಲಾಸಸ್ಗೆ ಹತ್ತು ಪರ್ಸೆಂಟ್ ರಿಸರ್ವೇಷನ್ನು ತ್ರೀ ಸೆವೆಂಟಿ ಅದು ಮೂರೇ ಸಂವಿಧಾನದ ತಿದ್ದುಪಡಿಗಳು ತೊಗೊಂಡು ಬಂದಿರೋದು ಮಿಕ್ಕಿರೋದು ಹಿಜಾಬು ಅದೆಲ್ಲ ಮಾಡೋದಕ್ಕೆ ಅವ್ರು ಸಂವಿಧಾನ ತಿದ್ದುಪಡಿ ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಆಗಿರಲಿಲ್ಲ ಹಾಗೆ ಅವರು ಸಂವಿಧಾನ ತಿದ್ದುಪಡಿ ಮಾಡ್ದೇ ಒಂದು ದೌರ್ಜನ್ಯನ ಅವರು ಎಸಗಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಸೊ ಹಾಗಾಗಿ ಮತ್ತು ಇನ್ನೊಂದೇನೆಂದರೆ ಅವ್ರಿಗೆ ಅವ್ರಿಗೊಂದು ಭಯ ಇರೋದು ಸಂವಿಧಾನ ತಿದ್ದುಪಡಿ ಮಾಡಿದರೆ ದಲಿತ ಸಮುದಾಯದವ್ರು ಕೋಪ ಮಾಡಿಕೊಂಡು ಅವ್ರ ವಿರುದ್ಧ ತಿರುಗ್ಬೋದು ಅಂತ ಸೊ ಹಾಗಾಗಿ ಅವರು ಸಂವಿಧಾನನ ತಿದ್ದುಪಡಿ ಮಾಡದೇ ಇರ್ಬೋದು ಇರೋ ಸಂವಿಧಾನದಲ್ಲೇ ಎಷ್ಟೇ ಅನುಚ್ಛೇದಗಳು ನಮ್ಮ ಪರವಾಗಿದ್ರೂ ಸಹ ಅವರು ಸಂವಿಧಾನನ ಉಲ್ಲಂಘನೆ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಸೊ ನಾವು ಲಾಯರ್ಗಳಾಗೂ ಸಹ ನಾವು ಸಂವಿಧಾನನ ಹೆಂಗೆ ಉಪಯೋಗಿಸ್ತೀವಿ ನಾವು ಸಂವಿಧಾನ ಇಟ್ಕೊಂಡು ಹೆಂಗೆ ವಾದ ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ಅನ್ನೋದು ತುಂಬ ಮುಖ್ಯ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ಮತ್ತು ಅವ್ರು ಹೇಳಿದ್ರು ಲಾಯರ್ಗಳಾಗಿ ನಾವು ಎರಡು ಮೂರು ಮುಖ್ಯವಾಗಿ ನೆನ್ಪಿಟ್ಕೋಬೇಕು ಲಾಯರ್ಸು ಬರೀ ಕೋರ್ಟಲ್ಲಿ ವಾದ ಮಾಡೋದಲ್ಲದೆ ಆಚೆ ಚಳುವಳಿ ಚಳುವಳಿಗಳ ಜೊತೆ ಬೆರೆತ್ಕೋಬೇಕು ಸಿವಿಲ್ ಸೊಸೈಟಿ ಮೂಮೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಜೊತೆ ಇರಬೇಕಾಗತ್ತೆ ಎರಡನೇದು ನಾವು ಲಾಯರ್ಸ್ ಅನ್ನು ಮಾತ್ರಕ್ಕೆ ನಮಗೆಲ್ಲ ಗೊತ್ತು ಅಂತ ನಾವು ಅನ್ಕೋಬಾರ್ದು ನಾವು ಯಾವ ಚಳುವಳಿಗಳಿಗೋಸ್ಕರ ಹೋರಾಟ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀವೋ ಆ ಚಳುವಳಿಗಳ ಮಾತು ನಾವ
uh, like the three Kashmiri students who, who were allegedly, you know, uh, said to have said pro Pakistan slogans and then the Hubli Bar Council said that they will not represent them. So, like, I want to, like, in this case, uh, there, there are these lawyers who will say that we are not going to represent certain people, and here we have this legal community who is saying that, yeah, I mean, the role of the legal community in tackling the fascist state. So, I just want to get your opinion, like, uh, uh, is the legal community like actually really united in what, what they want to fight for, or is there like still some kind of? What is the future of all those who are in jail under Prima Uh What is the realistic? Hello, I'm Rizwan Khan, social activist. You have mentioned about the recurring loss of the government, the present now, and the intention behind that all the laws, the what the government is up to. And people are losing faith on the judiciary. So what a common man can do at this juncture? Regarding the questions raised, 1991 Act, even though there is an Act which is codified, after that also several issues have been raised. In the entire nation, this old issues 500, 400 years back, issues are digging where communal hatred and tension is prevailing. We educate community how to uh, come out and what is the steps we have to take. Thank you. I think. Uh, one or two issues uh, pertaining to the role of lawyers. I personally, I think no association should pass a resolution that a particular person should not be given legal representation. I think that 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 is the bottom line. That you can't, though, I mean, uh, uh, look at it from another angle. Like I, for instance, I am talking about myself personally, okay? I would not take up a case of a policeman okay, who is alleged to have killed somebody in police custody. Okay. I would not take up a case of a management against workers. Okay. But that's my personal choice. While I don't take up their case, I still would say that that person has a right to legal representation. Even that policeman has a, a right to legal representation. And I would not participate in something okay, uh, in a resolution where you say that this person should not be given representation, which has been happening not just here, but also across the country in, in various, uh, 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 various bar associations have been passing these kind of resolutions that nobody should represent this person, etc. I think this is completely scandalous and should, not, should never happen. Okay? That's one thing. Second thing is I think it's also important that for lawyers, okay, and uh, lawyers who are working, who are trying to battle out what is happening right now, to come together, form associations. One association is already there, which has invited us all here, uh, which is an extremely good step. But it's very important that uh, lawyers derive their energy from each other. Okay? It, because it becomes difficult uh, at times uh, to work in, in silos and uh, try to work out strategies, etc. Because all of us have different experiences, even as lawyers. And it becomes important to, to draw, on the, draw, draw on that experience in order to arrive at better strategies, etc. That's one thing. Third thing I just wanted to say, uh, as far as the, across, as far as the uh, question about uh, the political angle is concerned, I completely agree with you. I mean, the limited time I had, I, I, I just focused on certain things and, and did not focus on certain things. But I completely agree that you are today, I mean, see, there is a whole debate going on in the uh, in the world today, uh, amongst the legal, uh, on the jurisprudence, etc., the main aspect which is going on is that in authoritarian states, okay, can you work purely as a human rights lawyer without okay, being a struggle lawyer yourself, without being a, uh, uh, without being linked to the struggle, because a pure human right lawyer, okay. Uh, would say that I should represent a policeman who is, or an, or an army personnel, his, uh, personnel who has been, uh, who has gone and shot down some 10 people, point blank, okay? Because every person has a right under human rights, 
jurisprudence, every person has a right of legal representation. Okay? So as a, as a pure human rights lawyer, you would be doing that. Okay? But as a struggle lawyer, as a, as a movement lawyer, okay? as, a, as a lawyer representing a cause, okay? one looks at structures of power and then decides whether to take up a case or not. So I think uh, that that is something which is uh, which becomes very relevant as the state tends to be more and more authoritarian. Because as the state uh, state tends to be more and more authoritarian, it becomes important, okay? and it it becomes inevitable for lawyers who are dealing with these kind of issues to take political stance. They did not take on every issue. But on certain issues, it becomes important for them to take political stance. Otherwise, okay, fighting a battle against a state which is increasingly authoritarian, even legally, becomes very difficult. That's, that's one thing I feel. As far as uh, the aspect of the Atrocities Act is concerned, I, I, before I come to the aspect of Atro Atrocities Act, I just wanted to say one more thing, uh, which I did not mention when I was speaking, that when you're talking about human rights, lawyering, etc., etc., one normally talks about High Court and Supreme Court lawyering, which is a big mistake. Okay? The large amount of human rights lawyering, the large amount of really solid work for the marginalized people, etc., takes place at the trial court level. Okay? And that's what one has to recognize, that at the, 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 the trial court level, the work, the kind of work which happens, which goes unseen, unreported, okay? but which is much more effective at times, much, uh, much more effective than what is happening in high courts and Supreme Court, and that needs to be recognized every time. Okay? Because otherwise we have this hierarchy amongst lawyers also, you know, uh, which is that okay, my high court ka lawyer, my Supreme Court ka lawyer, this, you know, this, uh, this person is a trial. Trial court lawyer is most of the times much more important than a high court or a Supreme Court lawyer. Uh, and that, that's something which we have to recognize. Lastly, as far as uh, two things, Gyanwapi Mosque, I think the seeds of this were sown during the Ayodhya verdict. And now we are seeing, and while in the Ayodhya verdict, they, uh, they made a big, uh, uh, you know, as they normally do, they gave a speech about how the 1991 Act is part of the basic structure, basic structure of the Constitution. That's what they said in the Ayodhya verdict. That it's part of the basic structure of the Constitution, and so therefore this Act can never be repealed. That's what they say in uh, in the Ayodhya verdict. But obviously now they are finding subterfuges because what their argument now is that 1991 Act, okay, stops the conversion of a religious place from one kind to another kind after 47, but it says that it does not stop the assessment of what kind of religious place it was before 1947. So what they are trying to say now is that since before 1947, Gyanwapi was never a mosque. That's why the 1991 Act does not come into play, because 1991 Act will come into play if it was a mosque before 47, and we are trying to change it. Since it was never a mosque, we are not trying to change it, and that therefore, uh, you know, that, that is the kind of arguments which are going on right now as far as Gyanwapi Mosque is concerned. So it's a completely different, but it's a subterfuge by the Supreme Court, by the, by the, uh, by the District Court, by the Magistrate, etc. It's, it's a clear subterfuge, and it's opening up a Pandora's box from which there will be no return, you know. And that you are seeing in Karnataka in three different places, this issue has already risen as to whether this is a mosque or this is not a mosque, etc., etc. Okay. So that's, uh, as far as Bhima Korega uh, case is concerned, uh, I did not have a chapter on astrology when I studied law, so I, I do not know what is going to, uh, uh, what is going to ultimately happen. But as you know, but, we are reasonably hopeful that in the next year or so, most of the people will be out on bail. We are reasonably hopeful of that. Yeah. Uh, what was the question about atrocities? I, and about the, lastly, about the atrocities issues, that uh, the Dal atrocities against the Dalits, which are increasing, which is part of the casteist agenda of bringing out a Hindu, bringing about a Hindu Rashtra, atrocities are increasing. We are seeing it 
uh, seeing many more atrocities even reported. Okay? At the same time, the approach of the courts to the issue of atrocities is very, very, very problematic. Okay? And I think we need to fight that approach of the uh, uh, courts. Approach of the courts is problematic in two cases of this kind, where they always talk about misuse. One is domestic violence, and second is uh, atrocities. In both the issues, they will always raise the issue, raise the case, Are there is so much misuse, there is so much misuse. Okay? And they are more worried about misuse. Misuse happens in UAPA, nobody talks about it. Misuse happens in various other laws. Nobody, to, no judges are willing to talk about it. But when it happens, or so-called, so-called happens, and so to begin with, they are biased against any case on atrocity. This is this is the reality. The police are biased. The judiciary is biased. That's the reality. And we need to fight it collectively. And I, I, I guess the only way to battle it out is by showing, by doing more research on the actual ground level atrocity cases and how. These cases have been dealt with by the courts, lower courts, high courts. Etc. I think it's very important to do that. That's that's all it's. I actually was an optimist, just like you said you are. But uh, in recent times, that's rather dwindling. Uh, so I was wondering, what will you say that uh, you think they are not going to try to change the constitution? Because I have got the feeling that they're just waiting for the next elections when they get a bigger majority possibly, and then they go ahead and do exactly that. Because to make the Hindu Rashtra, they would need to do that. You mentioned APDR today. So in one of the protests in Kolkata, uh, it was called for the APDR. Uh, so the, the, there was a discussion that the police said that if you go ahead with the rally, we'll put you under DM Act, the Disaster Management Act. And then there was this discussion amongst the APDR lawyers and the uh, non-lawyer activists that if the lawyers are rounded up, who will really go and release them? So what we uh, face here is that uh, if you, um, uh, because it is a rule by the law, a lot of the fight also happens by the law, uh, but also you have to fight against the law. So the lawyers there were saying that if, despite knowing our rights, we don't stand up for our rights, then how can we expect the uh, common masses to stand up? And we non lawyers were saying that if you get rounded up, let, instead, let us go ahead, he will come back and release us. So this conundrum, if you can. मेरा कहना है कि सुप्रीम कोर्ट और हाई कोर्ट के सीडीओ कास्ट और जो जजेस की संख्या है नगण्य है और उसको फुल फिट कैसे किया जाए महिलाओं की हालत तो खराब है ही है दलित की हालत तो बहुत ही खराब है इसमें बाबा शाह की चिंता उस समय भी बहुत हुआ करती थी और आपके जैसे लोग आज हम लोग इस लीगल फैटिनिटी में आए हुए हैं तो ये बहुत मजबूत है मजबूत बात होगी यहाँ से जाना एक कॉलेजियों के द्वारा एक भी सिटी कास्ट का नाम सजेज में नहीं जाता है जिसके कारण आज पूरे भारत से एटोसिटी के मामले में आपने जैसा अभी बोला कि बैमान पुलिस तंत्र और बैमान जुडिशियरी के कारण दलित और महिलाओं पर अत्याचार होता है इससे बचने का उपाय होता है uh, one is about the constitution, whether it's going to be overhauled or not. See, my my expectation is based on two or three factors, as I said. First, that Dalits own up this constitution as a gift of Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar. So till such time as they need support of the Dalits, they are not going to completely do away with the constitution and bring in a new one. Okay. That's, that's, that's one thing. Second thing is, any way, whatever they want to do, they can get away with it without amending the constitution. They have been getting away with it without amending the constitution. So they will do it uh, yeah, without amending the constitution. The third thing is that I think uh, they may or may not, uh, see, they, they, Modi especially and some of his cohorts are very interested in the international reputation which he has. Because he likes to see himself as an international leader and international statesman and all that kind of thing. I mean, uh, another thing that nobody else sees him that way, but uh, I mean, that's why, I mean, sometimes people have that kind of uh, self-assessment. So uh, he likes to see him that way. 
and uh, it's important and i don't think the idea is to declare have a constitution which says india is a hindu rashtra instead you have a situation where all elements of hindu rashtra are there simultaneously you have all elements of all formal elements of democracy you marginalize the muslims and marginalize the dalits completely you subjugate them you make you create a situation whereby the muslims and the dalits feels that they have they have no voice they can't do anything so many muslim friends of mine who can afford to go abroad are already saying that we are going going to go abroad but we don't want to stay in this country no that's the situation most of the people of course can't do that they can't afford to do that Okay. so the idea is to completely make them non citizens second uh, second class citizens if they can achieve that without amending the constitution they will do that okay. if they cannot then obviously the amendment will come so i am not saying that amendment will never come or something or overhauling will never happen i am only saying that presently it doesn't look likely that's that that's all i am saying uh, as far as uh, sorry what was the question this question ha ah, yeah see look at the situation supreme court and various high courts have been over the years restraining the right to public protest i think it has happened in karnataka also that you go to one corner where nobody hears you nobody sees you and you go and protest in an echo chamber where you only hear yourself it's happened in mumbai where you have azad maidan which has been specified supreme court jantar mantar okay so the and the whole idea of protest is to make yourself heard by the people against whom you are protesting that's the idea of protest that people against whom you are protesting should hear you but that has completely gone away completely negated and and so <coughs> i can very well understand if lawyers say that let us go to let us also be arrested doesn't matter and of course the non lawyer say that if you are arrested but by looking at the way the situation is even if the lawyers are out there is no guarantee that they will be able to bail out anybody so it is better that all of them go inside together <laughs> so that, that that's what as far as the uh, the the number of dalits in the higher judiciary is concerned you are right that uh, dalits tribals you have some kind of tokenism in supreme court that one judge must be from minority community it may be a parsi it may be a christian it may be a muslim that kind of thing you you should have one judge who you are looking for who is from dalit community so they look out for one one judge who is from dalit community so you ended up with balakrishnan i think Uh, so, no, no, they never look for Adivasi because they, uh, so that that's a, they look for women that we must have some adequate representation of women. But obviously, it doesn't actually reflect or represent. But that's true also in terms of the bar. Okay, how many Dalit lawyers, okay, are allowed to really be successful professionals at the bar? okay that is also it uh, even that is uh, now slowly it is happening okay even women like when i started practicing there were hardly any i mean there was only one woman judge in supreme court for the first time appointed fatima bibi and then sujata manohar etc etc and now you have three three judges four judges etc etc but you are right i mean see technically they will not have reservation but they will have a, some kind of a quota which is an unspoken quota by which they will appoint obviously you need more dalits you have justice gavai right now there who is the uh, uh, who belongs to the dalit community but many times what happens is with the uh, with and i have seen this also with women judges and also with Dal, uh, dalit judges that uh, i remember with sujatha manohar justice sujatha manohar because she was in bombay high court so i had appeared before her that because she felt that she has become a judge because of her own not because she is a woman but because of her efforts and skills therefore no woman should be given any kind of benefit she should stand on her own feet and become and similarly 
uh, Dalit judges, I've seen the same thing happening sometimes. Okay? They feel that I have not come here because of reservation, so why should anybody demand any favors? If you are good enough, you will raise the rank. So it's not necessary. It is possible. It's not necessary that because you are a woman judge or you are a Dalit judge, you will necessarily have that sensitivity towards the issues of women and Dalits. So that's also something. So it's important to have Dalit judges, but it's also important to have good quality uh, uh, Dalit judges who are sensitized towards the issue of Dalits. That's, I think, also equally important. That's it. सुप्रीम कोर्ट फैसला देते समय अपने नीतिगत क्षेत्र से जो है अलग फैसला हक करके फैसला देता है जिसमें जो है आ, उसने जो है नीतिगत क्षेत्र में कई बार उसने उल्लंघन किया है उसने कई फैसले न्यायिक कार्य से बाहर चले गए हैं न्यायाधिकार सुधार अधिनियम दो हजार इक्कीस का बचाव करते हुए बचाव करते हुए शत्रु के विभाजन को ध्यान में रखते हुए केंद्र सरकार हावी होना चाहती है वो तो बात सच है एनजीएससी करना चाहा और एनजीएससी स्ट्राइक डाउन हुआ फिर और कई तरीके उन्होंने ढूंढे जिससे वो हावी हो चाहे वो जैसे आपने देखा कि जस्टिस गोगोई जिन्होंने प्रेस कॉन्फ्रेंस ली थी अगेंस्ट जस्टिस दीपक मिश्रा वो खुद जब उनके ऊपर आरोप आए तो किस तरह से सकम हो गए और फिर राज्यसभा में जाके बैठे और और वो दोनों टाइम के बीच में उन्होंने क्या निर्णय दिए वो वो देखना भी जरूरी है दीपक मिश्रा जज जो थे उन्होंने भी क्या निर्णय दिए कैसे वो सब सब सेंसिटिव मैटर्स अरुण मिश्रा के पास भेजते थे तो वो वो सब बातें तो सच है केंद्र सरकार कौन सी भी केंद्र सरकार होगी वो चाहेगी कि जजिस के ऊपर कंट्रोल लाए क्योंकि अल्टीमेटली उनके जो एक्शंस है वो कोर्ट में चैलेंज होती है बाकी तो कोई देखता नहीं है क्या उनको ये कहने का हक है मेरे ख्याल से उनको कहने का हक है कि सुप्रीम कोर्ट बरोबर काम नहीं कर रही है जितना हक हमें भी होना चाहिए कहने का कि बिना कंटेम के डर के कि सुप्रीम कोर्ट बरोबर काम नहीं कर रही है जो फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच हमारे लिए है वो फ्रीडम ऑफ स्पीच उनके लिए भी है तो उसका मैं वो मैं नहीं कहूँगा कि उनको कहने का हक नहीं है कि आप बरोबर काम नहीं कर रहे हैं वगैरह लेकिन वो कहने का और वो कहने का हक हम हमें भी उतना ही होना चाहिए मैं उतना ही कहूँगा कि सिटीजन्स वी शुड हैव द इक्वल राइट of criticizing the supreme court you have a directive principle of separation of powers which has been now elevated to the level of fundamental right the separation of power so technically yes whether the central government tries to influence the judiciary answer would be yes whether its influence always works we don't know okay it may work sometime it may not work sometime okay if it always work there is no point going to court okay because there are crevices within which we can always function which we uh, within which we can always hum log us pe kaam kar sakte hai isliye not all judges are bad not all judges are good some judges are good and bad both okay to us tarah ki paristhiti hai to ha influence karne ki koshish karti hai bahut time wo influence chalti hai कई टाइम नहीं चलती है सो दैट डिपेंड्स ऑन जज टू जज एंड टाइम टू टाइम ऐसा है कॉलेजियन सिस्टम पर के स्पष्टता पर सवाल उठ रहा है कॉलेजियन सिस्टम से जो नियुक्तियाँ हो रही हैं उसमें अपना अपन जातीयता का वो आ रहा है और कॉलेजियन सिस्टम के चलते बहाली नहीं हो रहा है तो क्या इसको ऑल जजन तो कॉलेजियम सिस्टम को खत्म करने की कोशिश एन से हुई थी लेकिन एन को स्ट्राइक डाउन कर दिया सुप्रीम कोर्ट ने 2015 में 14 में 
स्ट्राइक डाउन कर दिया तो कॉलेजियन सिस्टम मेरे ख्याल से कॉलेजियन सिस्टम जिस तरह से काम करनी चाहिए उस तरह से नहीं करती काम और कुछ दूसरा तरीका निकालना चाहिए कि जजेस जजेस के अपॉइंटमेंट्स का लेकिन वो तरीका ऐसा नहीं होना चाहिए जिसमें गवर्नमेंट का पावर हावी हो क्योंकि वो होगा तो जिस तरह से केशव भारती के बाद में इंदिरा गांधी ने जजेस को सुपरसीड किया अपॉइंट नहीं होने दिया चीफ जस्टिस अपॉइंट नहीं होने दिया जिस जिस तरह से चला था वो टाइम उस तरह की हालत आ जाएगी तो दोनों सिस्टम या तो एग्जीक्यूटिव अपॉइंटमेंट्स भी नहीं चल सकती जजेस अपॉइंटिंग दमसेल्व वो जो कॉलेजियन सिस्टम है उसमें भी बहुत प्रॉब्लम्स हैं तो दोनों के बीच की कुछ सिस्टम लानी चाहिए जिसमें जिसमें जजेस के अपॉइंटमेंट सिर्फ जजेस ना करें जिस तरह के आज चल रहा है लेकिन ऐसा भी ना हो कि एग्जीक्यूटिव का उस पर डोमिनेशन आ जाए तो इस तरह की सिस्टम आनी जरूरी है इन टूडेज टाइम वे वी आर सींग हाइटेंड अटैक अगेंस्ट आर कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल वैल्यूज वी आर लुकिंग एट द अनलिमिटेड कम्यूनल अग्रेशन कास्ट ऑपरेशन एंड सिस्टमैटिक सप्रेशन ऑफ डिसेंट फ्रॉम आई लाज वी फेल्ट इट वॉज एब्सोल्यूटली असेंशियल टू हैव डिस्कशन on the role of the lawyering, lawyering community in uh, countering this fascist assault i must say that when i first spoke to mihir and uh, asked uh, asked him to come and speak today and i was telling him that you know can you speak to us about the role of lawyers in the coming uh, fascist uh, attack he told me are you still waiting for the fascist attack this is what he told me and i think uh, in his uh, talk today he has uh, like he said we all whatever we want to call it we experience it and we know what we are experiencing and it becomes our uh, responsibility on uh, looking at understanding how we can really respond to it so i thank uh, advocate mihir desai for uh, coming today speaking with us and uh, sharing his thoughts on the historically the role of uh, lawyers in 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 really defending defending various the values of the constitution not only in 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 this country in india but also across the uh, across the world and from where we can gain inspiration in how we will really counter this um, attack that we are facing today while on one hand we we are seeing this this open assault on this most basic values the value of constitutional morality itself on the other hand of course we see we see a very strong voice of dissent also coming out we see communities of people coming out together standing up against this speaking true to power several of us several people here today who are part of that we have uh, various organizations here today from karnataka who have been uh, who have been speaking out against this kind of uh, attack speaking in defense of the constitution and its values and i thank everyone here who has come to uh, to today for this for this discussion and we hope that going forward we will also be able to really work together on 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 various aspects of this to counter this uh, uh, fascist assault the uh, we will as a, as was spoken we can't really see law but as a as a part of a larger social political arena of struggle and uh, it becomes it's a very important the lawyers play a very important role historically lawyers have played a very important role and uh, will continue and it be, and the responsibility of lawyers to to respond to this whether it is inside the courts or outside the courts is that much more so there are several lawyers who had come who have come in here today we are, we have uh, apart from those uh, who clifton had welcomed and uh, in the uh, in the, in the introduction we also have uh, advocate bt venkatesh who i think has stepped out who has also uh, we ah uh, oh yes we also have a uh, 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 btv bt venkatesh who is a friend of all of us and who's a uh, who's all stood on this side when we were being beaten and also stood uh, on our side while um, and defended uh, the rights of uh, defended human rights civil liberties right to it still so i also thank uh, advocate bt venkatesh for being here today and also everybody else i just like to conclude with uh, with with uh, with something that was said by a, a lawyer who is practicing in germany uh, clifton spoke about the uh, 
about the the way in which lawyers really were fighting against the german regime the nazi regime in in germany and um, there is one actually interestingly for people clifton and arvind have written an article called uh, the lawyering in impossible times where they talk about the various lawyers it's a very interesting read for lawyers to understand the way in which one can really look at lawyering in difficult times and they speak about a person about one advocate ludwig bendwick bendix and uh, his license was cancelled he was subsequently arrested for defending a communist and he says uh, and and i'll just close with this he says uh, despite all the disappointment and intimidation i am not going to let myself be beaten down i regard it my duty to myself to maintain my personal dignity by making use of every possibility offered by the law even currently in place and i think that kind of uh, hope that kind of persistence is something that um, we at ilaj look to uh, take forward in this in our fight against this uh, fascist regime so i thank uh, everybody for being here today and i thank uh, advocate mihir desai once again for accepting our invitation and uh, sharing his thoughts with us thank you and good evening